All right, today I'll be demonstrating fundamental capabilities of Genesis that improve our model-based system engineering efforts. But just as importantly, given the complexities we are currently facing today, these capabilities help us connect to the digital enterprise. So what makes Genesis so powerful? Genesis allows us to model our systems completely and consistently across our organization using what we call a systems meta model. And Genesis also comes as a single package. It's a complete system engineering tool that delivers the full capabilities of model-based system engineering in one package. There's no need to rely on other tools or plugins to complete your MBSE solution. And as a single package, uh, with the data organized in this systems meta model, you then have all the information at hand to connect with other detailed engineering tools in your digital enterprise. And now you'll better be prepared to tackle the complexity that you'll be facing. And complexity really is the driving force for our time. We are facing more and more complex engineering environments. We are dealing with systems that lack fundamental modularity. They are harder to partition and interfaces are more difficult to identify. When we do identify interfaces, they tend to have nonlinear effects and are more difficult to predict. And this results in unintended consequences. We confront complexities also with multiple chains of management. We encounter our systems of systems with larger sets of stakeholders and, and of course, competing interests. So complexity is also driving us in different ways in the way we interact together as our organizations. Complexity is driving us closer together. We, we, can, we are now moving from a multidisciplinary world into a transdisciplinary world. And in a multidisciplinary world, we could work within our different teams, you know, as system engineers and electrical engineers and, and, and maybe software engineers, we could work separately in different domains solving that same problem, but using our different languages and using our, our own lexicons. But as complexity drives us together, we need to become more transdisciplinary, which means we need to meet, work more closely across these engineering domains using the same language to come to a more integrated solution. So when our tools do not interoperate and, and communication is inefficient, we really cannot address complexity and we are siloed, right? We, we come back to that multidisciplinary world. So when we do become transdisciplinary, however, in our MBC approaches, something else happens. We come, become more concurrent with our engineering efforts. We need to become concurrent to combat complexity. And when we are concurrent, everyone in our organization now can gain the necessary insight to the evolving design when needed and where needed. We can identify complexity as it arises. And uh, when we become concurrent, when we integrate our people and our tools across the enterprise, and that enables us to be uh, more concurrent. So what does concurrent MBSE look like? Well, when we achieve concurrency, our teams communicate better. We are no longer siloed in our own domain. So MBSE here is depicted in this central object that's showing us that we are now connected together through our model-based system engineering design. Our system engineers can now interact with our detailed engineers. Our system engineering design can be adopted by our detailed engineers and, and other stakeholders. And our MBSC design now survives past the conceptual stages to coordinate development. Because it's an integrated solution, everybody gains that insight. It no longer just stays in the domain of system engineers. So in the past, we tried to become concurrent with documents or databases or diagrams, but it never really fully broke down those silos. So what is enabling us to break down those silos? Well, it's really this systems meta model that I talked about earlier. And what the system meta model is really is fundamentally a language. And it's a language that can connect system engineers with dig de detailed engineers, but also with our tools. So the language needs to be natural, even spoken. It's not just visual constructs that are, that, that are that's connecting us. The language really needs to capture those ideas and concepts that we have as system engineers and the relationships among them. So the, the, we need the natural language, though, to facilitate, facilitate communication between the humans, but also a language that can also be used digitally to facilitate tool integration. 
Now, the language is expressed in this system's meta model that leads to a more comprehensive understanding and completeness of our design. So, what does the system meta model, model look like? Well, let's think of briefly of an of a entity relationship model, a model of key system engineering ideas and concepts. And here is a simplified view um, of uh, the system's meta model that we've defined here at Vitech. It's really a formalization of the mental models that we carry with us as systems engineers and a formalization of the language we speak. Now, the relations, relationships defined in the meta model serve specific uses. They are not mindless many-to-many -many connections or orders constructed on the fly. They are purpose-built. So, for example, in this, in this diagram in, to the right, in the center right, there is a yellow ob object called function. And that function has an arrow pointing up towards the, another object in blue called requirement. That arrow is really a relationship now. We can have one of two relationships that we can pick. We can pick a based on relationship or a specified by relationship. And there are specific situations when we pick one or the other. It's also important that these relationships be defined in both directions so we can query and traverse the meta model in any direction no matter where our starting point is. So if we're starting with the requirement at the top, we can use a, a reverse relationship, say a basis of relationship or a specifies relationship to point back to a function. So the system meta model here has been refined by Vitek over the years and has really stood the test of time. It has been adapted to support systems development, architecture efforts, verification and validation, and even program management. Now using a systems meta model, Genesis users have been able to successfully model a variety of systems from business processes to satellites to oil and gas systems to even submarines. So with this meta model, in each site, it, um, we have now a Genesis project that has a rep MBSE repository that has instantiated the systems meta model into a schema. Now we can model our systems using the systems meta model as an organizing structure. The systems meta model now underpins everything we do in Genesis. A project repository consists of all the design inventory from requirements to behavior to design. Information is completely digital and not locked up in graphical formats. So we can connect now seamlessly with the digital enterprise through an API that now allows us to query back to that repository of information and take advantage of that information as it's organized into that project schema. So now as we're able to connect with tools and humans and people, we are now able to connect our digital enterprise. So in summary, the theme today in the webinar we have a systems meta model that helps connect teams of systems engineers, detailed engineers, and their tools. Our MBSE efforts are adopted by our stakeholders and survive through the conceptual stages and into detailed engineering. Since detailed information is now available to all the stakeholders, complexity can now be identified and communicated from anywhere in the organization. And now we have now become concurrent with our engineering efforts. All right, so for the rest of the webinar, I'm going to be talking about five main capabilities of Genesis. I'll first show how Genesis can be used to do requirements management, and then I'll show how you use Genesis for behavioral modeling. Then I'll talk about system design, and then finally show how we can connect all of this to our verification and validation efforts. Finally, I'll talk about how we can connect Genesis and our MBSC information to the digital enterprise. Okay, so here I am with a requirements or with a project that I'm using now to motivate a requirements management study. I'm going to be modeling what we call a geospatial library. So think of a, a virtual library where customers will come and make requests for images. 
And so we're going to come about this with uh, from a requirements perspective. So I'm going to click on the requirements folder here in our Project Explorer on the left. And when I do that, you'll see that we get an element here that I've defined previously now in the browser. And this, this element here you, we can think of as a top root node for our requirements hierarchy that we're going to be working on. Now I can go ahead and start building on this through the property sheet, but the property sheet is kind of a textual manual way to interact with our, our repository. What I want to do is show us how we can use uh, more graphical means using diagrams to interact with the repository. And to do that, we can come up here to the top on the Views tab. And when I click on the Views tab, it gives me a number of options here in this ribbon. And in this case, this requirements entity is, is, um, can have a spider diagram, a hierarchy diagram, or a, a requirements diagram. And in this case, I'm going to click on the requirements diagram, and this is going to bring up a fully compliant SysML requirements diagram. And I can um, model that. All right, let me just position this here. You can move things around here. We have uh, on the right a toolbox here. You can move things around here at the top. You can zoom and zoom out with your mouse here. Let me just position that here. And then you have an insert tab here in the toolbox. And in the insert tab, we have a number of constructs that allows us to interact with the diagram. So for requirements management, the first thing we can now start doing is starting to build out our requirements set. So I have about two require, main requirements in mind for this little demonstration. And I'm going to start off with adding the first requirement. I'm going to click with my left mouse button here on this new requirement construct and just drag over into the canvas and I'm going to land on this node here and then when I do that it's going to highlight and at that point I can just let go of my mouse and it's going to drop in a, a default requirement. It's going to give it a default name requirement 001 for example but let's say uh, that's not the requirement name I want here. Um, it's very useful in Genesis and in fact almost necessary to have a short name for our, all our entities in our model. So I can come here and add uh, an attribute. I can come down here with my right mouse button click and come up here with um, a variety of attributes that I can set, just as I could in a, in a property sheet. So I'm going to come here to the name, and I'm going to give a short name to this requirement of availability. And now another um, attribute that I can set here is a description. And I'm going to pull this off my clipboard. And I've got one here for an availability requirement. The system shall be unavailable no more than a total of 10 minutes per month. And as I go ahead and add that, it's being added here to the, the template that we have here for our requirement object. And now when I read this, I recognize this as a, as a kind of a non-functional requirement. And so in Genesis, we have another attribute that we use to classify these types of requirements. So I'm going to click on the set attribute here again. I'm going to go down to type. And I'm just going to call this a constraint requirement, which is what we, we used here, Vitek, to define non-functional requirements, RNA type requirements. And that just helps us with our workflow. It helps us identify which relationships we want to use later from the systems meta model when we create mappings to parts of our design. All right, so I had a second requirement in mind. So let me do the same thing here. I'm going to left click and drag, and I'm going to drop this in. But this time, I'm going to hit the control button on my keyboard before letting go, and then let go. And it's going to come up with a, a little dialog screen here so I can immediately enter the name I have in mind for this requirement. In this case, I'm going to um, add that here now. Drop that in like that. Very good. And then I'm going to also now add a description for this requirement. I'm going to pick it off my clipboard again. So in this case, I picked the requirement states this. The system shall retain an inventory of previously collected images and products and provide them to the users if appropriate. 
So if we put on our system engineering hat and look at this, we can see that there's really a lot of things going on here at the same time. And it's best if we have requirements that are focused on, on particular topics or subjects. So what we want to do is really break this up. It's, it's really a compound requirement. So in the Genesis workflow, we can use that type attribute again to identify the fact that this requirement is really compound in nature. And we use the term composite in, in Vitech and Genesis to describe that. And that'll, that'll let us know that we have to look further in this hierarchy to get to um, fully defined requirements. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and add some requirements here to break this requirement up. The first one here I'll add, this will be say acquire product. And then I can add a second one, call it retain image. And then finally add one here called provide product. Very good. All right, so let me just go ahead and for grins just complete this. Um, I'll add a description here. for acquiring that image. And I'll set another attribute for the provide product. Finally, I'll add a phrase here for retaining the image. All right, so let's say we've done this work as system engineers to refine and improve on this compound requirement. And if we look at these requirements now and assume that they're complete, we can see that they're functional in nature. So these all have a type of function. And rather than set that attribute three times, we can simply shift click on each one of these requirements, right click and then set attribute, and then find that type attribute, and then set this as function. All right, so we've gone through the process of identifying two requirements. We've kind of refined one requirement, broke it up into three different ones. And at the same time, what I want to emphasize is that while we've been interacting with the diagram, we've also been adding information to our model-based systems repository. So let me just move this off to the side for a minute. And let's go back and look what's been happening under the hood with Genesis, we can see that if we go back to that requirements folder, I have now populated that with five extra requirements. You can see that the requirements that I've added on the diagram have also now appeared in my database. And I can click on, say, retain product inventory, and I can see that now that description element has been added here. The, the, the type attribute has been added, and all of the relationships that I created by dragging and dropping have been added, right? So we are fundamentally working with our repository as we add information to our diagrams. And to drive the point home, I can actually go up to a different diagram. I can come up here to a, say we call it a hierarchy. It's a more generalized version of a hierarchy. It's a little more flexible. Um, it gives us this query that allows us to define what types of relationships we want to show on our hierarchy. I'm just going to go ahead and hit the requirement um, button here. Let's see. For the main requirement, there we go. Now, see if I move this over to the side, you can see that it looks a lot like the diagram that we had earlier for our requirements diagram. If I bring that over now into view, all right. So the information that we entered through our requirements diagram was entered into the model-based systems repository, and now Genesis can use that information to render a completely different diagram. Now you'll see that the information displayed in the hierarchy diagram is slightly different than the information displayed in the requirements diagram. So for example, the requirements diagram shows descriptions while the hierarchy diagram does not.
Well, we can control that. We can control that through what we call the, on the properties tab. So each of these diagrams will have a properties tab and it will allow us to control different aspects of the way the diagram looks. And so one of those is the template. And you can see here that in the hierarchy diagram we are adding, we are displaying a number element, uh, a name attribute, and then the class alias attribute, kind of think of it as a stereotype. And then in the requirements diagram, and if you look at that property sheet, we can see that we're showing the class alias first, then the name, and then the description. All right, so that's just what we want to display on our diagram. The inf all that information is in the repository, so we're free to look at it any way we want to, and especially with the hierarchy diagram, we're not constrained by any standard that we need to meet for our di diagrams. All right, so one more thing we can do here to show the, na the how nice it is to have these hierarchies in place is that I can come up to the main root node here and I can choose to now renumber my requirements. Now this renumbering will be arbitrary in nature. It will allow us to kind of give us a nice hierarchy listing of our requirements. And you can see here that it's just rolled right through the the hierarchy organization and it's created um, a first level set of requirements and then a second level set of requirements. And now that's just a, an organizing number that we can use within Genesis. It's not necessarily the number that we use in our doc documents um, or, or from a, a database that we are interacting with. All right, so that essentially is how we interact to build out our requirements set. But with system engineering, we also know that we work iteratively and we define requirements, we define behavior, and we define system design. And then at, at a certain point in time, it's necessary to start mapping our requirements to that design that we've created. So going back to the Insert tab, we can now interact with our uh, system design and start mapping these requirements appropriately. So for example, our availability requirement, we know that is a constraint requirement and then through the systems meta model, we know that we should be using a specifies relationship to another component or to a component. And so I can, I can make that relationship here by picking on uh, what we call the block construct. Now the block is of course the sysml name for a, a component. So I can bring this block over onto my diagram and I can now let that up, let go of that as it highlights there on availability and I can now go to my folder here and pick off uh, the component that I want to have specified by this requirement. And there it is on the diagram, it shows up and it shows up also in the hierarchy diagram using the specifies relationship. So it's got both directions covered here. Now when it comes to the functional requirements, we want to map those to functions. And when we do that, we'll be using the basis of relationship in the systems meta model. And to do that, to map to functions, I have to look for activities here on this on the, as a construct. And so I can come over here. So I'm going to pick an existing set. I'm going to use this construct here because I have an existing set. And when I drop that in, it's going to bring up a number of different classes here that are available to me. I'll pick function and then I'll pick the function that I have here in mind for how I'm going to go about acquiring these images. We can see that as kind of a root node here for a number of set for a set of behavior that'll enable us to acquire a product. And similarly, we can have a set of activities here for what we need to do to say to retain the image. You know, we want to store that image once we acquire it. And then finally, you can format and send the product. All right, so that'll be a way to kind of connect with that behavioral model and make sure that our functional requirements are, are being covered appropriately with our design. All right, so we've learned a lot about how to interact with Genesis and a, a particular diagram, and especially how to interact to do requirements management. So the next thing I want to show is how we can use Genesis to do behavioral modeling. All right. So with that, let's see, I'm going to go to a different model. I'm going to go to a model here that I have in mind where I will demonstrate how to demonstrate um, 
how to go about charging an electric vehicle. All right. And I'm going to do that through the this function folder. I'm going to start there. And when I click on that function folder, I'm going to get another, say, root node here, if you will. It's going to be the um, object that identifies the, the set of behavior that I have intended for charging this vehicle. So I can click on that element, and just like I did before, I can come up to the Views tab, and I'll have a set of diagrams now that are available to me. And since I'm dealing with functional elements, I'm going to have a whole set of um, functional diagrams that uh, will enable me to do my modeling. And I'm going to click on this Enhanced Functional Flow Block Diagram. And when I do that, you'll see I've got two, two uh, functions that I've already defined. I've already added these to the model. Now we're looking now inside the charging thread. This is showing the decomposition of this charging thread object. We're not looking at it hierarchically like we did the requirements, but we're looking at it from its decomposition perspective. So when we think about how we're going to charge a car, the first thing we can think about is you know driving and parking our car, and then we'll need to decide whether we need a charger or not. Well, to do that, we'll need to check our battery level. So to kind of get this thing rolling, those will be the first two steps. But there are going to be really just two outcomes of checking that battery level. And it's either going to be have a sufficient charge or it, it won't, right? So we can come over here to our insert uh, construct and, and pick a select construct, which gives us that or nature to the logic. But we also have another construct available to us that I'll demonstrate today, and that's the exit condition. So I'm going to I'm going to click and drag this over, just like I did earlier, and you can see that highlight, so it knows where it's going to land. And I'm going to pick uh, some exit conditions. So these are the OR conditions that will be allowed for checking our battery. So the one condition will be a sufficient charge. Let me try that again. So let's go on. And then I'm going to add low battery. I see. I had to I put both of them in. OK, so now I've got both of these exit conditions here. And you can see that they've, they've been annotated on each of these branches. And now I'm free to start working more with my behavior model. So let me look at um, what I might want to do if uh, has sufficient charge. If the car has sufficient charge, what I might want to do is just leave the car behind. And I've defined some other functions here. And I can pick that off my list. I can just add, leave that car right away and be on my way. But if it's a low battery, I've got more things to do. So I'm going to pick off a parallel construct that allow me to do you know, more than one thing at the same time. And so I'm going to annotate these branches based on the activities being performed here and who's doing them. So in the first case, I can come down here and I can edit this and say, well, in this bottom branch, I'm going to allocate this kind of to the human. This, everything on this branch is going, to be, is going to deal with the human. And everything on this top branch is going to deal with my charging station. Now, I'm not really allocating anything at this point. I'm just annotating the diagram. All right, so what do I do if it's a low battery? If I'm a human, the first thing I need to do is actually kind of go over to the charging station and start some charging. I've got to you know, provide some information and get that started. Okay, and then after I start the charging, I'm free to leave the car and just go about my way. So I can model that here by just copying the one I had earlier and then pasting that onto this branch here. 
Okay, so now what is the role of the charging station? Well, the charging station, once it once the human gets over there, it's going to initiate the charging. And then it can actually go ahead about starting the car or charging the car. And when I do that, I'm going to bring over an iterate. I'm going to try to model this charging on an hourly basis. And this iterate is sort of like a loop. It's going to loop through the logic here according to the um, definition of of a domain constraint here. And here I've got um, what I call charge time. And the charge time is modeling how many iterations that we'll be modeling here. And I've got a count here of 16. So in my world, this is going to be 16 hours of, of charge time. And then I can go ahead now and drop in an entity here for charging the car itself. Great. And so now I can um, iterate over that function 16 times and it'll be, and each time it runs through there, it'll be simulating one hour of charge. Now we're almost, almost done here. There are a few more things we need to add to this diagram. For instance, we mentioned earlier that when we start charging, we need to walk over to the charging station and, and initiate the charging. We, there are some actions that we'll need to do information we might need to provide. So we can model that with what we call a trigger. And the way I can set up a trigger, it's it's like an item of exchange. And I can click on the origin and then click on the destination. And then you'll notice up on the ribbon here, I have an, ob uh, an option called connect via trigger. And I can just click on that. It's going to bring up a target class from the systems meta model called item. And I have something here uh, defined called charging information. And I can add that there. And what this does is it exchanges information, but it's also changing flow control so that the initiate charging will not really start as a function until the human is, is finished in implementing and giving that information over. Now, the other thing I need to model here, I would like to model is the actual charging of the battery. And so what this, the way we do that is what, with, with what we call a resource. And if I click on the charge car icon here, the, the node, if you notice in the diagram, um, we have some resources here. And resources are, can be captured or consumed or produced. And I'm going to produce energy, so I'm going to produce battery charge. I'm going to click on that. And then when I do that, it, it brings up that target class of a resource, and then it gives me this uh, choice here that I've added previously of a battery level. I go ahead and add that. And this is going to model the battery and the charge level that it has at any point in time. And we can click on that to bring up its property sheet. There we go. And you can see I have an attribute here for maximum amount. And the maximum amount here has been set to 22.5, in this case, kilowatts. And I've set an initial amount of 1.5 kilowatts. That just gives us uh, the starting point and the end point. We model how much energy is added every hour through an attribute on the relationships. So here we have a relationship called produced by. And if I and I can see here that the object here is charge car function. I can click on that and I can see there's an attribute that's opened up it's called amount. And now I can enter the amount of charge that will be um, added each hour, each with each uh, execution of this function. All right. 
So now we're pretty much set. We can now start to simulate this model. And I'll do that by going up to the simulator icon that's available here in our ribbon. All right, so when you get the simulator view, you get um, you know some space where we'll show the animation. And then at the bottom, we'll have a transcript, which will show each and every step that's happening within that simulation. And there are a number of different options here that you can pick to control your simulation. I'm going to pick deferred rendering. And, and I'm going to hit run here to model this. And you can see now what's happening in our in our model. We're, at the top, you're seeing the battery being charged. This is a, a, a kind of an indication of our resource level. And then here towards the bottom, you're seeing the actual functions that are, are kicking off and, and executing. So now it's run to completion. And you can see that what we did is we parked our car, we checked our battery level, and then we started the charging. Now, in that time period the charging station was essentially kind of waiting for us to finish with that and then it was able to now kick off the charging. In the meantime we were able to leave the car while it was charging. Now every hour of course it's starting it's doing some of this charging. You can see that at regular intervals it's doing just that as it's cycling through that iteration. And at the completion of each one of these iterations you can see it's adding some energy into our battery. We can see that effectively by just hovering over that resource level. And we can see that in this instant, it, the magnitude is 6. And then in the next iteration, it's now added 1.5 to 7.5. And it does that sequentially until it gets up to the, the maximum here, which is 22.5. So it hits that maximum level at the end. But if you notice, this one looks a little wider than the rest of them because it actually hit that level one one cycle early. We actually charged it in 15 hours, not 16. So that's just some of the, the details that you can kind of tease out of your, your behavior models through simulation, and you can better understand how it's, how it's acting and how that might influence your design or your requirements. All right, so before we move on from behavior modeling, there's one more thing I wanted to show you, because we have been interacting with our, our model-based repository underneath all of this. And to kind of show more of what we can do and how we can view this same information with other diagrams, what I want to do is I want to change the node template that we've got here. I'm going to come down here and pick on a different node. I'm going to pick on name and allocation. All right, so now some of these have been allocated previously and some have not. All right, so we know some of these, these functions are going to be done by a driver. Some are going to be done by the charging station. So I can come back here to my insert node, come over here to key properties, and I can come over here to, um, let me go to all properties, all, all entities. I'm going to go over here to component. And you can see when I click on that, I'm actually interacting with the repository, and it's showing that I've defined a charging station component and a driver component. Now what I can do is I can drag these entities onto my diagram to create this mapping. So let me just try this with driver. I'm going to click and drag, and I'm going to drop this in, and it's going to give me an option here. It's going to tell me what relationship in the systems and meta model is allowed in this case. And in this case, the driver is going to perform a function. And now it's going to add that as an allocate relationship. And I can now show that on my template. Um, I can do the same thing here for start charging. Drop that over. Add that there. And then, of course, for charging car, I'm going to give that to the charging station. So now I've added that. So now what I have is a good allocated functional baseline of this thread for charging the vehicle. And when I have that in place, I can now look at the same information now in other ways. So I can go to my view for my thread here, and I can pick on, say, an activity diagram. An activity diagram is another SysML diagram, and here you can see I can maneuver over here. 
you can see now this is in kind of a vertical format, but you can see I've got the park car, I've got a check battery level, it splits in the same way, I can immediately leave the car and go, or if I need to charge, I can go ahead and do that. I can also change the layout here in the ribbon, with the ribbon on an activity diagram, I can switch that around now to make it horizontal, it looks a little more like the EFBD. There you go. And then there's another diagram that's available to me, and that's the sequence diagram. Now, since I've allocated those components to my functions, they now become the swim lanes of my sequence diagram. And then you can see that the functions now are just the little objects here on each swim lane. So I've got a, a parked car, I've got the check battery function, and then under some cases, I can skip, I can go right to leave car, but if I decide I need to charge, I can I can go ahead and do that. And then after I've decided to enter that information, I can shift over to my charging station swim lane, the swim lane here, the charging station will initiate that charge and then loop through the charging. So here we've got a complete um, set of logic here that we have for our functions, okay? So two diagrams here for the price of one, really, because it's the same information, it's just depicted with a different perspective. All right, so the next thing I want to do is show you how we can use Genesis to do um, modeling of our physical design. And with that, I have a, a model, or a, excuse me, a project developed here for a CubeSat. Now, CubeSat is really just a little microsatellite. They're very popular nowadays, and a lot of people are building these. And I've developed a, a quick model here. I'm going to go to my component folder to show you that I've got you know, 35 elements in this model of, uh, uh, of a CubeSat. And to show you how it's laid out, I'm going to go to a, the system context. This is like the root node of my components. And here I'm going to go to a VBD diagram. Right. All right, so let me just hide these a little bit. All right, well what this diagram is showing is showing you the hierarchical design of the system context. So the system context here is composed of a deployer, a launch vehicle, launch services, ground network stakeholders and then the mission itself. And the mission is composed of a ground system and a satellite system. The satellite system is composed of all the normal subsystems that a satellite has, a GNC, a C and DH, a comm subsystem, an EPS, a thermal subsystem, structure, and then the scientific modules. And then uh, I can click on one of these items and select it. And then if I do a control double click, it'll open up a, another level in this model. It's just not seem to be working for me today. There we go. There it goes. So uh, what you can see here is that the EPS is made up of the battery, the PDU, the solar array, and a power conditioning unit. And now I can add a new component to this design, and then I can go to the toolbox. I can go over to what's called an, a part, and that's the SysML version name for a component. And I can click on that and drag that into my diagram and let go, and I can add a new component here. I can click on that, set an attribute, give that a name. I call that name product PMU. It's a power management unit. Okay. So that shows you how we can look at our physical design hierarchically. 
but let's look internally. How do we wire this up? What are the interfaces? So now let me go down to the electrical power system itself. I'll click on that element here in my browser, and I'm going to pick up another diagram from my view menu here. I'm going to pick the physical block. When I do that, I can sh you can see that I've defined a few things here. I've defined some of the links already. Um, you can see that the solar array is connected to the PCU, the battery is connected to the PCU, and the PCU is connected to the distribution unit. Now, as I've added the PMU earlier in my PDD diagram, it's also showing up here in my physical block diagram. Now, I want to connect the PMU to each of these three objects, each of these three components. So to do that, I, I just can click on one and then click on the PMU. I've now, what I've essentially done is define the endpoints for my link. And in the diagram ribbon, I have an option here to connect these nodes. And so in the context of a physical block diagram, Genesis knows I want to work with links. So it's going to go to that link target class. And I can now just add a new entity to that class. It's going to come up here as link 001. But when I enter it, it's actually going to rename that based on the order that I clicked on those, those units. Now, another way to enter links is through these connections. So that's a, another general ver term for these connect these links that we want to add to our physical block diagram. I can just click and drag. This time, I'm only going to indicate one of the endpoints. You can see here I've got a link here that's now been added and without the endpoint. So to connect it to the PMU, I, I cl click the PMU and then click and drag that over onto the link itself. And you can see now Genesis knows to wire that up. All right, so that's just a quick way to show you how to interact with your diagram, your physical design through the um, through a kind of a, a block definition diagram and a physical block diagram. Now the next thing, the next step of our system engineering process is the verification and validation. So I've got another diagram here that I have in mind to show you how we can um, connect our verification and validation work to our system design. So what I have here is uh, I'm going back to the original requirement, that, or re, re, the original project that I have defined, where we looked at our and defined our requirements for our geospatial library. But in this case, I'm actually looking at this through a verification facility. So I'm having I'm looking at a, some newer, um, some different classes here. I've got a, a verification requirement class. You can see I click on that. I've got a number of verification requirements defined. I have a verification event class here, test activity, and even test configuration. So let me go to the verification requirement class folder and click on this first requirement. Now, a verification requirement is a means for us to define our methods for doing our tests. And you can see there's even actually a, uh, an attribute that we can use here to define what our select, selected method is, whether it's analysis, demonstration, or inspection. And we write our verification requirements with about you know, five key elements. We want to have uh, our, uh, our objective. We want to have um, a process or an approach. We want to have any kind of special conditions. And of course, we want to have some success criteria. So this is the um, means for us for kind of starting to de define how we're going to go about doing our verification for a particular requirement. But now we want to actually map this to the to our design, to our, our requirements. And I'm going to do that through um, our hierarchy diagram. And when I click on that with the verification requirement, it's going to come up with a slightly different um, stored definition here for our hierarchy. All right, it's going to come off the same way. That it's going to look much like the requirement diagram we, we were using earlier. But this time I'm going to um, go to um, this display all entities construct here. And I'm going to cycle down, I'm going to scroll down here to 
the requirements folder. And you can see now I can come back and I can add the requirement that I want to verify. So this is retain product inventory. I'm going to match this up with our verific verify product retrieval and delivery verification requirement. I just click and drag like I always have. I can drop that and it'll highlight. And it's going to give me a choice this time. It's going to give me two choices of the relationships that I have open to me based on the system's meta model. And in this case, since I'm doing verification, I'm going to pick verified by. Good. And now another item I can pick here is the verification event. So the verification event is that time on the calendar when we all get together and, and do some testing. And I've defined a verification event here called system test. I can drag that over here onto the menus, onto the diagram as well. And it comes up with the fulfills option here from the systems meta model. All right, so now with every verification event, I can now define the test activities that I want to run during that event. And I can have a number of these different activities defined for different verification requirements. But in this case, I'm going to pick the test product inventory here. And that is an accomplices relationship here. Good. So now you can see that we can interact with the uh, verification requirement much the same way we did it with our requirements earlier. In fact, I can go back to the requirements. I can go back to the requirements that we did define earlier. I can go to our retained product inventory. And I can either go to the hierarchy or the requirements tab here and you can see now that I have actually added the verification. That verification requirement that I added earlier now is showing up on my requirements diagram. Okay, so now I've, I've shown you the four main tasks that system engineers do. Requirements management, behavioral modeling, system design, and verification and validation. And now the last thing I wanted to show you in the webinar today is how to go about connecting Genesis with the digital enterprise. We have a number of connectors available to us. And what I'm going to show you today is the connector for Excel. And to do that, I'm going to go back to a, uh, I'm going to go to a, a special sample model that we have for the geospatial library. It's a, a more complete model. It has a more a full definition of the component design, the behavioral design. What I want to focus on are the requirements again. If I click on the requirements folder, you can see that I've got a number of these now defined. And I can click on this first one. The geospatial library shall provide continuous real-time support to customers. The system shall be unavailable no more than 10 minutes per month. So you can see this is kind of the requirement, the composite requirement where our availability requirement came from. All right, we can see the availability requirement here as well. And we can you know, jump down here to say maximum staff 2.4. We can see that the system shall be staffed at a maximum of 30 personnel on any shift. All right, so that just gives you a review of the, the data that is in our repository for this particular project. Now I can go to my Excel spreadsheet here. And I've previously logged into Genesis here. And I've also previously added the Geospatial Library as the target project. And when I do that, I can now start to pull information from the project. And I do that through a table definition. Now the table definition is now also kind of an automated query into our database. And I have a number of predefined definitions available to me. I'm going to pick the requirements definition. When you do when I do that, it's all pre-populating all the different choices for this query. It starts off by selecting the requirement folder from our schema. And then column by column, it's going to report on the number of that element in that folder, the name of that element, the type, the description. And then it's also going to show a refines relationship. It's going to point to the parent requirement. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and load this up. 
And you can see it's pulling all that information we saw earlier. So we have that same continuous support ability requirement. And we also have maximum staff. We also have the 30 personnel on any shift. Now I can go ahead now what, and, and actually make changes and push those changes back into Genesis. When I created this spreadsheet, Genesis actually created um, bi-directional relationships here with the database. And um, so I can go ahead and say, let's say I decided that I want to have only a maximum of 20 personnel on any shift. And let's say my availability requirement, let's say I just want to move that down to five minutes. Okay, so when I do that, I made these changes. Genesis, the connector here in Excel, has highlighted those cells. So I know what's changed. And now I can publish these changes back into Genesis, into the repository. Okay. And it's now updated those two cells. And I can go back to the model that I had before. And if I go look at availability requirement, I see that it has changed now. It's no longer 10, it's been changed to five. And if I go to maximum staff, I see that it's gone from 30 down to 20, all right? So this is a way to show you how you can connect with Excel, but it's also a mechanism here that you can also use to connect with any detailed engineering tool. We have a number of these available to you through the utilities tab, for example. You can connect to doors in much the same way that we've just connected to Excel. You can also connect to Simulink and also do the Phoenix Model Center tool. All right, so uh, this brings me to the end of the presentation today. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and call me. Uh, let me give you my contact information here. You can reach me at marksimons at fitechcorp.com.